నమస్కారం గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ టు ఎవరిబడి గ్రీటింగ్స్ ఫ్రమ్ సాహిత్య అకాడమీ ఐ వెల్కమ్ ఆల్ ది వెబ్లైన్ వ్యూవర్స్ ఫర్ దిస్ పీపుల్ అండ్ బుక్స్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ ఆఫ్ సాహిత్య అకాడమీ బై ఫైవ్ పిఎం నౌ బికాస్ యాజ్ యూ ఆల్ అవేర్ సాహిత్య అకాడమీ స్టార్టెడ్ ది ఇండివిజువల్ ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ త్రూ Uh, made the author program in 1987 within next two years academy started another distinguished program called men and books uh, in 1989 around 30 years 32 years back and which program has seen very important personalities of our nation as well as international personalities here the distinguished persons from interdisciplinary areas are invited to give lectures about 40 minutes and then interaction now because in the webline we don't have interaction since so see uh, the our guest will deliver only uh, their uh, impressions on literature either he or she enjoyed a literary work or got insights from the literature they speak on uh in this people and books program which was related and uh, for example people like scientist because first program was started in 89 with uh, dr jayant narlik padma vibhushan and uh, he was a assist uh, and the second program was none other than dr manali sarabhai the internationally famed dancer then music director vijay raghavrao uh statesman dr karan singh jurist and diplomat lakshmi mal singhvi then salil choudhury shriram lagu uh then our other statements like atal bihari vajpayee ems namudri pad and do dandavate and sculptors like chintamani ka uh, and number of such personalities of national and international repute have been participated in this west program of sahitya academy so today we are having a internationally known dancer and scholar dr rajeshi warrior from tiruvananthapuram let me introduce her to the benefit of our webline viewers and literary lovers dr rajeshi warrior he is an eminent bharatanatyam exponent educator and scholar of our nation widely recognized across the globe with her impeccable abhinaya and unique concepts she is one of the most sought after performer and guru in bharatanatyam she is a musician and has obtained a phd in music from the department of music university of kerala she is also a writer on arts and culture an empaneled artist of indian council of cultural relations dr rajeshi is also a an a grade artist of doordarshan and other channels in bharatanatyam and she also found a director of tarika a center for excellence in bharatanatyam carnatic music and uh, experimental theater as she uh, is also recipient of several national awards including uh, devdasi deshiya natya puraskar kerala sangeet natak academy award and uh, mahila tilak award and uh, kerala state award from different uh, uh, different levels she had done many choreographical uh, musical and theatrical presentations she imbibed the rudiments of bharatanatyam from guru v maidili and later also trained under guru jayanti subramanyam in music she is primarily trained under late uh, mullamur harihara ayer and 
Virum Babu G. Ravindranath, uh, who are well-known musicians of our country. So, Dr. Jayashri, Raj, Rajashri Varya is doing human service in the uh, field of music, dance, and culture. Now, I request her to present uh, her views and impressions on literature uh, within the next uh, 40 or 45 minutes for the benefit of our web language. Madam, it is time for you and please start. Huh? Uh, once again, I welcome Ananda. Thank you so much for uh, such a rare opportunity given to me. I'm delighted to discuss those literary works which impacted my sensitive being as a creator of art and as an enthusiast of literary works. And let me also say that I'm overwhelmed by the invitation to share this coveted platform, earlier honored by country's foremost minds in art, science, sports, etc. My sincere thanks to Sri S.P. Mahalingeshwar, Regional Secretary, uh, Sahitya Academy, Bangalore, and poet Prabhavarma for this rare honor bestowed upon me. In fact, for any voracious reader, it is hard to cite a single book or two from an ever burgeoning list of liked books. By the time one reaches middle age, even an average reader will have a huge list of choices, naturally. <clears throat> My father introduced me to the world of books. It is but a, but a rare feat to have read almost all Malayalam translations from Russian literature, both children's literature and greatest of prose, even during my school, and also some comparative literature on Marxism and Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Apart from these numerous biographies, autobiographies, historical accounts of both Indian and non-Indian writers, I could even manage to get a copy of that time sensational autobiography or biography, you may call it, My Story by Madhavi Kuti. Lives grow as we move forward in life. But there are a few things in our life which lingers in our mind, how much ever we move forward or grow. There are some books or referring as a habit. I have deliberately omitted non-Indian authors. I shall just name very few and discuss that one tome which has brought tears upon every single read. Dr. M. Leelavati's Malayala Kavita Sahitya Chaitram is a habitual read from the time I got the book so many years. From C.N. Srikantan Nair's trilogy, the play Lanka Lakshmi is my all-time favorite. Yes, it is Ramayana from Ravana's point of view. Ravana in all his human capabilities and shortcomings is the character so intensely portrayed. I always get deeply motivated by the rediscovery of a person and himself. But Ravana, different Ravana in Ashwanta Naya's Langa I could live a bit of his Ravana in my dark adaptation of the same. This long poem, which has captured my attention and imagination, the verse novel, Shyama Madhavam by Sri Prabhavarma. Like Ravana in Lankalakshmi, Krishna comes alive with 
makes vulnerabilities. The human solidification makes sense lesser and no lesser. Not those unparalleled qualities or superiorities which makes a character go in nature. Sometimes the ordinariness of superhumans <laughs> makes them more intimate and properly understood or empathized. Who is Mas Krishna Shyamama? Another work of poetry of recent time, again, which I hold close to heart is Ranjit Hoshote Janave. Humanity, its ever swelling helplessness, its atrocities on nature, its swallowing of the universe and the unsurmountable wisdom owing to ignorance finds vivid portrayal in journal. From nonfiction, the one book which stole my heart is India's foremost feminist economist, Patma Bhushan Devaki Jain's memoir, The Brass Notebook, a no holds barred memoir. On account of its sheer honesty, one could read it umpteen times. Though she belonged to a privileged class, her journey as an economist, seeker of truth and reality, becoming the voice of underprivileged women, women were not so easy. The struggle a woman faces with while enabling herself to grab whatever well within her rights is something any independent woman of 70s or 2021 can relate to. She discusses those people who motivated her, attacked her, loved her, and how a woman takes the life forward in all its charm and beauty without compromising on principles and home. And for her, home is the place where those loved her unconditionally lived. I have become a fan which made me even a report of her. However, if I'm asked to pick two from my most recent reads, I would pick a prose and a poetry. Poetry is my first love and long poems are my solace and refuge. I do not have the courage to touch upon the lyrical ones of poetry for fear of missing out those presentations. I had to go for prose in fiction. A work which stands out for its little charm, descriptions, magnificent portrayal of the aftermath of war in the country's psyche, choiceless plight of its participants, never ending fight of women and deepening wounds of its children. The second one I want, even after reading the and Stands out for its lyrical contributions of war in a country's key. Choices leveraging fight of the women, deepening wounds of its children. And no one that they put in my mind even after repeating language Malayalam and its English translation. by Sarah Joseph. Uru Kaval by Sarah Joseph, Sarah teacher, as she's affectionately called by her admirers and students. Uru Kaval finds its English literary life in the, in the vigil, meticulously translated by Srimadhi Vasandhi Shankaranarayan.
instinctive conviction speaks, speaks through their one and only source of affection, Angadan. Son of Vali and Tara. Son of many Ammas, including Ruma, wife of Sugriva. I shall read out a bit from the Malayalam blurb, which I translated into English. Even in modern times, am I audible? Yeah. Even in modern times, there are many interpretations of Valmiki's Ramayana. Ramas, Dala. Yeah, some necklace. But Urukavil is a restless journey of Angada, beholding darkness, who defy Rama's moral ethicality on killing his father, Vali, and even questions him. Angada transforms into that word of sorrow, which women of Ramayana unfanned in its embers itself and never lived to be showcased. Angada ridicules the dharma of Rama, who push his ethical wife toward the unethical ordeal of chastity. Angada becomes a solitary wonderment, like a statue of antiquity chiseled out of a rock in the middle of a sea. We can see the primal poem faltering from its familiar pace, owing to the distressed touch of Angada. Urukavil is thus one of its kind in Eirthachan's Malayalam. Based on Ramayana, it is a story of Kishkindam, its irreplaceable loss called Vali and the unprecedented gain of his brother Sugriva. Dethronement of Vali has left Kishkindam orphaned, let alone his own son Angadan. The narrative sets off through memories of Angada about his joyous childhood. Essentially, Urigavali is Angada's perspective of his own life juxtaposed with the life of his many amas, mothers, including Tara, who would soon be the better half of Sugriva, the killer of his father. I shall read out a bit from the first chapter, the English translation of Urigavali. The Vigil. Next to the blazing fire, we lie down beside Amma, me, you, and Pitan. She's my Amma, mine, only mine. I push you both aside and climb on top of her. I grab her breasts. These are my Amma's, my own Amma's breasts, and you are jealous. Amma asks me, Angadan, do you want to hear the stories about Maruti Ammavan? Very early in the morning, we woke up. Standing on our toes, we saw the rising sun, a ripe red fruit. We coveted it, wanted to pluck it, put it in our mouths. Suddenly, it disappeared behind the leaves. Must have been frightened at the thought of being eaten up. Who told you that you would get burnt if you touched the sun? Amma began to make clay pots. She used the clay that we pressed and kneaded with our feet. Where did you get this from? I had taken it from a spot marked by my father, a spot surrounded by seven sala trees, sticky black soil mixed with dry and decaying leaves. Amma didn't know how to hide her happiness. Her eyes opened wide and her face turned red like another red fruit. I would do anything enter any forest or climb any hill for a glimpse of that look of pleasure. Me, Pitan, and you. This is Angadan's perspective, let me remind you all. Amma had asked us to knead the soil, but we rolled around in it. We lathered our bodies with mud, turning ourselves into three black kutibhutams. Then we cheered with glee. Fed up of our antics, Amma had to wield the stick. So we ran straight to the river. 
how boisterous we were in the water. Three children transformed into 30. Grumbling that we were dirtying the water, Toppen, the washerman, and his wife came to meet us. Look, see how the clay is dancing playfully in Amma's palms? With it, she can make anything in this universe, even the universe itself. Amma told us before that, before noon, she would make a new pot and place it in the kiln. I shall cook payasam in it for you, she said, looking at me. Wasn't I the one always greedy for payasam? But I stood there and whimpered, I don't want payasam. Amma was stunned. What do you want then? I pointed to the rising sun. Steam it for me. She burst out laughing. Go then, pluck it and bring it to me. I will steam it for you. She smeared the wet clay on my cheeks. It felt so cool. Amma's laugh is like the soft rustle of leaves. Soon it began to rain. A few drops at first. Then it grew bigger and bigger. I could feel it growing inside me. It swelled and became unbearable. There was thunder, lightning and gale. Angadan, why do you sit here in the dark, alone and glum? Your Amma is looking for you. Amma? Which Amma? I have many Ammas. Tara, your own Amma, the mother who gave you birth? Tara. The sun is no longer a fruit to be consumed with greed. It has turned into a dark blob of blood. Who squeezed this blob and poured darkness over me? Everything has turned hazy. I am scared. I had a place to live with walls made of light, pillars of glowing rays stacked one above the other. Amma explained to me, Angadan, your mind is like a playful child. It takes time in its hands and plays with it, needs and mixes it as it likes. It will turn yesterday into today, tomorrow into day before yesterday. What is yet to happen will be transformed into that which has already happened. Thus, at this moment, I could see the sea which I actually saw only later. I had no doubt that the tails of the monkeys ought to be blue. Transformation of the past to the present is in this novel is often unobtrusive. Past is eclipsed with the present. Angadan's unblemished love for his mother Tara is felt throughout the narrative. He lives his ominous present sitting on a wondrous past and Tara is the binding thought which keeps him connected with the universe. Tara is Angadan's universe and for Tara, universe is not existent beyond Angadan. As readers, we run into Angada's vulnerability as a pampered child. At one point, it is revealed through a conversation between Ammas and moving water. It's a beautiful sequence. After giving a heartwarming account of Angadan, we are acquainted with Ruma, Sugrivan's wife. The art of weaving, weaver's life, struggle are brought forth in a colorful manner. Colors of yarn sometimes bridge a hopeful past with the hopelessness of the present. Their melancholic strain, overpowering the authoritarian moves of, of Sugriva, engulfing the song and the sung, submerging the surroundings with strange bondings and separations. Women sang and weaved. Their submission to cotton plant enabled them make fine clothes, which were softer than clouds and as cool as water. While seeing this beautiful artistry and cloth by Ruma, we actually hit our head on the protruding sins of a valleyless fish kingdom. Every word or deed by the Supreme One is justified here.
Thus, when Vali was killed by Rama, accusing him of making him, making his brother's wife his own, the people of a small country became lordless. Entire people of Kish Kingdom turned insecure and this defensive, and they were they were unaware of this new justice. For them, Vali living with Sugriva's life wife was well justified, and went well with the tradition. But betrayal is that which justified the killing of Vali by a shot fired from a hidden place, and rumor, Sugriva's wife. couldn't bear wali's loss she was accepted by wali when sugriven wandered aimless insecurity of sugriven is wonderfully painted uh, through a conversation i shall read it out sugriven asks ruma am i not handsome brave courageous eligible ruma remains silent all through the novel silences play an active part in bridging and breaking relationships he asks what is this stuff that you keep weaving weaving she says night's sorrows don't you know how to speak in simple direct language without using poetic words a person is what she utters that was her answer the ruthlessness of the privileged towards the less privileged magnifies the powerlessness and invariably augment their incapacity to fight back thus every word or deed by the supreme one is justified here rumors intelligence over the plainness of vision in sugriva speaks of the destiny the writer would bestow on sugriva humans exercising supremacy over an animal clan animals effort to rise above animalism which with a suddenly acquired skill called intellect all reinstates a long forgotten path of righteousness called the justice of nature revolutionary attributes of taran taran is tara's father and angadan's own expression of rage and defensiveness have reminded me of the endless revolt in george orwell's animal farm but for the winner and then we are introduced to the valor and dignity of vali by the story is narrated to angada by his ammas then you cannot but fall in love with vali like i fell in love with ravana after reading langalakshmi and especially after dancing the ravana of langalakshmi the monkey clan in vali's kingdom owed its thriving wealth and health to vali and vali alone people of muchli a fishing township knew how to sieve salt from sea gold and silver were exchanged to taste a pinch of salt in cooked food a judicious tax system was ensured by vali and his personal visits to muchli empowered the region and its men women and children to the extent that vali was no less to god if something was missing they were soon to receive it in plenty through the generous imparting of the same by maruti angadan smaruti ammavan maruti ankal and that was intellect intelligence too a novel idea to the strong and energetic monkey herd this very intellect would soon oust vali from the minds of monkeys and consecrate the ill-fated sugriva in his place nevertheless some of them might still form enmity towards sugriva but seldom do they know that a thought well thought could replace any deep love with conditionality to make sure that you get what you give tara's growing insecurity touch the pinnacle of sorrow when she decides to protect her child by calling him back to her womb through a ritual this chapter is stirring 
on its portrayal of affection of a mother towards her child. I'm very sure that many mothers have gone through a similar mental condition and would have chosen to take such a step, such a drastic step to call their children back into their womb. Tara's helplessness or all mothers helplessness distrust on others, Tara's own commitment towards her son, all are so vividly portrayed in this chapter. Heart, in fact, heart of this novel uh, has spread its life in two chapters, I would say. One, the ritual part and Tara's life after Wali. I shall read out this chapter a bit. Feeling a deep hopelessness, Tara contemplated recalling Angadan back. She requested her faithful maids and Angadan's other Ammas to come secretly to her home, Vividham, from where they could go to the Pushkaram Lake. Recalling a live child to his Amma's womb, it was a cruel and unthinkable deed. Her companions advised her not to do this. Soon, tomorrow, if not today, Angadan would be placed in charge of the country. He might be a child right now, but he would grow up soon. His intellect would sharpen and physique develop. Like Wali, he would also turn out to be a strong and just person. But Tara's decision was firm. Before they kill him, I shall take him back. He will be well protected in my womb. Angadan was her priority. He should live. I shall not allow him to fall prey to any conspiracy. Even before the whistle call announcing Wali's death grew faint in her ears, she had to go to Sugrivan's chamber. When her assistants decked her and led her on, Angadan stood half his body consumed by the night and the other half visible in the light in a corner of Vividham, gazing intently at her. Hardening her expression, she strengthened her heart and walked away without offering any words of consolation or looking back. Every time I read this, but I struggle much to withhold tears. Sugrivan's palace was well decorated. Even for a, from a distance, she could hear the sounds of drum beats and celebrations. The streets were colorful, decked with flowers and fruits and other festoons. Many men, women and children their bodies painted in different colors, made playful gestures of love and laughed and cracked jokes, lending an air of excitement to the streets. Tara said as she walked through the decorated house of ministers, before I go to Sugriman, I have to meet Maruti and thank him. Maruti's home was secluded and calm. The fragrance of burning incense greeted her. Maruti came down wearing simple white clothes. His white hair, beard, and mustache shone bright in the gloaming. He brought his palms together and bowed to Tara as he would to his mother. He touched her feet and paid obeisance to her. Both of them couldn't say anything for a long time. Then Tara put an end to the uncomfortable silence. Maruti, how well you have fulfilled the desires of Sugriman. Don't you see? 
before the cinders of Wali's fire have cooled. Tara goes to Sugriven's bedchamber, all decked up. Wali's son hides in Vividham, sad and scared, all because of your astuteness and shrewdness, your statesmanship. Maruti shrank into himself as though hit by a stone. And as he began to speak, Tara got up and walked away, jingling her waist bells more than necessary, her clothes revealing rather than concealing. I'll skip a few paragraphs and move on to the next part of the same chapter. Pushkaram Lake, surrounded by hills, was a water body that men could not enter. Not only were they prohibited from entering the water, they were forbidden from even setting eyes on it. For those who did, emerged as women. As a result, men never went near or gazed at the surroundings of Pushkaram. If a man went there unknowingly, he was subjected to content and a hellish life afterwards. Even birds, the travelers of the sky, night birds and kinaras changed their flight paths on spotting Pushkaram. It was believed that the red-beaked birds that thronged the thickets on the shores of Pushkaram were male birds turned into females. Lake Pushkaram had the mysterious aura of a seductive woman. In solitude, she lay facing the sky, fully revealing the sensuous beauty of her body to the planets. The beauty, when the lotus leaves caressed by the wind turned their faces down, of her tender and lingering movements, when the lotus stems bent graciously to one side of her pure mind, and the shining water droplets glistened on the leaves. Even though the sun and moon desired Pushkaram, desired her, they were afraid to approach her. They didn't even want to be reflected in her waters. They only dared to cast furtive glances at her. In the second yamam of the night, a servant woman emerged from the cave known as Vividham bearing a lit torch that pierced the darkness. A red light circled by a gray border. Behind her, another woman came carrying a humming, cranking machine which made an ear piercing sound. Following them came Tara, Angadans, other Amas and more servant women. All the women wore blood red flower garlands around their necks. Their faces were, were smeared with turmeric and charcoal paste and their bodies were coated with an unpleasant smelling herbal juice. They had prepared themselves for the journey to Pushkaram, where Tara would take Angadan back into her womb. After a brief silence, the women began to hum together in a lamenting tone, which sounded like hundreds of bumblebees buzzing. Then the humming group moved forward. Angadan watched the women's procession, standing on the tallest structure of Vividham. What was Amma trying to do? How would she take him back? Can a mountain take back a river? Or a tree, it's a ripe fallen fruit? Can a word already spoken be taken back? Tara spoke. Angadan. When their children are in great danger, all mothers want to do this, to take them back into their wombs. Mothers know that there is no place in the world as secure as a womb. No one can enter that space and subject their children to sorrow. Angadan guessed it was something like the sorcery old Chulimuti practiced on children to cure their illness.
Pushkaram slept fearless, cowered in the warm darkness. Hearing the distant sorrowful mourning, she woke up with a start. She saw many women stepping down from the hill and approaching her, humming a tune that sounded like growling of hungry leopards or the keen of she monkeys in labor. She was usually woken up from her sleep only when people faced extreme danger. Soon the lit torches were reflected in the water. After sticking the torches to the ground, the women moved into the water. They immersed themselves three times, then climbed to the shore. The servant women filled the clay pots with water. Carrying the water pots, humming a tune, they climbed the hill and disappeared. Hidden by Pushkaram in a vacant spot, the servant women had constructed a large thatched, thatched hut shaped like a she monkey with a protruding belly. In the third yamam of the night, Chuli Muti would arrive in Vividham. She would use her magic to make sure no one saw her. Invisibly, she would enter the cave and cover Angadan's eyes. Then she would take him away. Seeing so many women wearing huge masks in the red light of the torches frightened Angadan. On the, ma on the masks were drawn the figures of evil spirits. Stumbling and staggering, they approached Angadan. The women surrounded him, humming a mournful tune. They tore off his clothes and made him sit on a stone. One by one, they poured the water collected in the pots over his head. This is your amniotic fluid, they murmured in his ears. The cranking machine made a terrible noise and the women too joined it, moaning. Chulimuti held the Angadan's hands and made him walk. She then ordered him to enter through the mouth of the monkey with the protruding belly. When Angadan entered the thatched hut, the women screamed as though they were in a house of death. Tara and other mothers squatted, their legs spread wide, holding the clay pots between their thighs. They were naked. Since they wore masks, Angadan could not recognize them. When they came out of the hut to the tip of the monkey's tail, they snipped the umbilical cord tied around his waist and symbolically severed the relationship forged by it. They placed it inside the pots filled with water as though they were facing it inside their own stomachs. They closed and covered the mouths of the pots with lotus leaves. Chulimuti set fire to the hut. Tara's servant women ordered Angadan to run away and escape while they danced around the fire. After this moving account, there is a, another moving chapter on Tara, her motherhood, Ruma's affection for Angada, and the intact bonding between Tara and Ruma. And another woman in Angada's life also makes her appearance here. And her name is Swayam Prabha. People of Kishkindam at war gets to meet her on their way to catch Sita. And that is again a beautiful account. And Swayam Prabha is like an ever glowing woman, ever glowing presence in Angada's life. Angadan says, we were trapped in a woman magician's cave. Using sweet fruits, cold water and cool breeze, she ensnared us and kept us there. 
Having suffered in the blazing heat and writhing in unbearable hunger, we gave in to the kindness she showed us beyond the cave. Time sprinted. Angadan would later think of Swayam Prabha's welcome in this way, as if there was nothing noble in her actions. There were other interpretations as well. Each person would reach his own conclusions from the same story, land and nurture them. A forest of stories would thus be created, but Tara would believe only Angadan's stay. Sometime in the ancient past, during a tempest or earthquake, a golden city was completely buried under the earth. Generations that came later built and raised their own dreams on it. A woman as old and ancient as that treasure stood guard over it. She was probably an evil spirit, a woman who did not submit to the tyranny of time. Was she young or old? No one knew. A mendicant with the form of a ghost, still beautiful to look at. If solitude took a shape, that would be her. This is the description of uh, Swayam Prabha. And for Swayam Prabha, Angadan's presence was a gift personified. For she was alone all through her life. She says, you are the people who brought the sound and smell of the outside world into my long years of solitary existence. I'm grateful to you. My world was without the sun or the moon. You stepped in holding the rays of sun in one hand and moon beams in the other. After hundreds of years, I saw the beauty of a smile that spread on another's face. You reminded me of how I had in some past, some past life stood as a tree on the banks of a river, flown like a tiny bird and swung like a fish. How can I not help you? We saw a sorrowful smile on Swam Prabha's lean face. Many of our people were still lying in the water. Some others continued to eat. The entire nature, in fact, partakes in search of Sita. And for Swayam Prabha, this woman of solitude, life hummed its rapturous tune in the presence of people in war. This story, this novel, gives strong representations of women. Tara, Ruma, Ia, Angadan's playmate, Swayam Prabha, the woman magician, and finally Sita. We see them from the viewpoint of Angadan. The woman in Tara finds herself caught in the turmoil of motherhood, war, its unavoidable realities, choicelessness, sickening compromises, boundless love for her child insecurities regarding child, resorting to protective measures, leading to immeasurable loss of peace and equanimity. Excuse me. Ruma is no ordinary girl. She gives hard time for Sugriva. Her intellectual height and sharpened wit did not fail to puncture the ballooned ego of his weakened existence. Ruma is a woman of words. Her words revealed her conviction in love and truth. Swayam Prabha's luminous presence lights up the middle of the story and thus Angadan's life too. Her short presence is ample enough to leave a lasting image of coolness of care and warmth of unconditional love. She appease the thirst of a kingdom at war. And in the last chapter, Sita appears in front of Angadan. But 
I'm not going to read any excerpt from that chapter because you must read it. The Sita, you would feel sympathy for, you would empathize her feelings towards Rama, towards Angadin, towards the entire universe. Sita seems to be Angadin's alter ego, braced between the splendor of future and pains of past. In this novel, Sita is alone and left out in the vagaries of an evasive today. Angadan's encounter with the woman for whom Raman befriended Sugriva is too memorable, I must say. And it brings the story to a halt. And we are left with no escape route to get out of the deep sorrow we experience. And this is Urukavil, a somewhat description of Urukavil or the Urukavil, which is there in my memory, which is etched in my memory. It's not the complete story and it's a crime to read the complete novel. I think I will be forbidding you all from the pleasure of reading if I read the entire story. It is such a beautiful experience living and reliving the story, the characters. I had many books uh, in my mind when this opportunity came to me like uh, T.D. Ramakrishnan's uh, Suganthi in uh, Andal Devanayaki, or many poems of poet Sugata Kumari teacher. Like, for example, Maricha Kunyungal Varinunda. There were so many books. But I chose this one book for its women. The women who could be anyone like you or me, or those women who have befriended the men, some of the men who are watching this talk. I hope I could give justice to the work, it's not a work actually, it's, it's, it's an honor, this honor, which came upon me. I've given, I've, I did complete justice to what I was bestowed upon. And uh, if uh, it's actually, it was actually very, very difficult for me to list out books or a single book. Initially, I was asked to read only one book and then, then it was quite difficult uh, for me. So I chose to uh, say a few words on the many books which have influenced me. It's such a rare opportunity uh, to be talking to the um, wonderful elite audience of Sahitya Academy. Thank you once again. Uh, uh, thank you, Sahitya Academy, for giving me this beautiful opportunity. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Rajeshri, madam, because you were a very nice presentation and uh, what insights and there's truth by this modern and postmodern texts in Malayalam literature as well as in this literature. Because Ramayana, Mahabharata, everything acted since Hirtachan period to till date. So you have almost covered whatever books you come through in this uh, literary journey. Uh, and so uh, immensely thankful to you for this very nice presentation. And I also thank our Malayalam Sports Convener, our dear 
Prabha Varma Ji for his, this wonderful uh, program, uh, giving us timely advice for conducting a number of programs in this headline series also. And I also thank all our advisory board members of Malayalam uh, for uh, assist their assistance and guidelines. Uh, guidance for conducting program. Uh, once again, I thank you and uh, I thank all the webline viewers on behalf of Sahitya Academy and Kaikan Kodi. Thank you. Thank you.